Good morning, and thank you all for joining us. I am Sarah Woodard David, the Survey and National Register Branch Supervisor for the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office here in Raleigh. And this is Flyleaf, a monthly conversation with authors and friends of the North Carolina Office of Historical Publications. And I want to thank uh, Sheila Carroll and Joe Beatty for organizing this series and for bringing Laura and me together today. Uh, joining me today is Laura Phillips. Laura holds degrees from the University of South Alabama and Tulane University in history and art history. She's been a consulting architectural historian in North Carolina since 1978. Her work has included numerous architectural surveys, nominations to the National Register of Historic Places, and other projects, including her long-term study of historic decorative interior painting. She's the author or co-author of seven books, including the topic of today's conversation, uh, Grand Illusions, Historic Decorative Interior Painting in North Carolina. And Grand Illusions was selected in 2019 as a notable government document in the state and local selection in the Library Journal. Uh, and if you're interested in buying a copy of Laura's book, it's distributed by UNC Press and it's available from your local bookseller. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. Um, let me start right off by asking you, what is your answer when people ask, what do you do for a living? What is, what is a consulting architectural historian? Well, I tell them that I do research, uh, photography and writing having to do with historic architecture, historic okay. buildings and structures. Excellent. Um, and I want to get started in the book by doing what basically probably all the very worst interviewers do. And I want to talk about myself for just a second. Um, when I was a kid, my parents were really active in the Stokes County Historical Society, and they dragged me to all the meetings. So sometime in the maybe the mid 1980s, I went to your presentation of your findings from your architectural survey of Stokes County. Um, I already knew that I loved old buildings and loved looking at old buildings. So I was I was watching pretty intently when you brought up an image of the Allen Tilliston House. I, is that how you pronounce it? Tilliston, um, Till, Tilliston House, I think. Um, which is, is not too far from where I grew up. Uh, the image showed some gray swirls on a white background and, and of all things, letters. Um, and there's a picture, there's this image, um, which we'll show you at the end. Uh, and what we were seeing, you said, was the ceiling. And you described the ceiling as being smoked, which is a process where the painter would have painted the ceiling and then swirled a smoking torch right under the wet paint. So the smoke kind of adhered to the paint. Um, and that blew my little kid mind. Um, I was not allowed to draw on the walls and I could see <laughs> fires in the house. And here someone has um, used the ceiling as a place for art and, and they had a, a torch involved in it. Um, so I pictured, I started picturing while you were talking, the monsters from where the wild things are. And I pictured them parading through this house led by the biggest one and he's got his smoking torch held high. And it was the very definition of a wild rumpus, which is what happens in the book. So I was spellbound, I was enchanted. Um, and that enchantment is something that I think runs through this book and through all the painting you show us. There's a sense of magic, whether it's a wild rumpus of the ceiling or it's marble veining that can fool you until you're you know, right up close to it. Um, so I was delighted you were writing this book and doubly delighted to get my copy and sort of relive that enchantment and to read your telling of the magical moment when you discover that a wild rumpus has taken place at the Flincham House in Surrey County. So I hope you'll share that, that, that sort of magical discovery with us and then um, and tell us what drew you into decorative painting. Okay, Sarah, that's a wonderful story. I just, the image of that, of the, the wild rumpus, I just, I, of course, didn't think of it that way, but I can see how a child would. And, yeah. and I just think that's, thank you for sharing that. I, I really like that. Um, I was pretty amazed with the Flincham House, as you know. Um, I was doing um, an architectural survey of Surrey County. Now, what I mean by an architectural survey is <clears throat> if you're doing 
a survey of a, a county, you um, pretty much work with a, a US geological survey map. And those maps show all the roads, they show all the waterways, they show little dots where buildings are. And the black dots are buildings that have been there for a good while. And they're not the more recent ones, they're in like red or pink. And um, they also show, the maps also show the topography. So you can see where buildings are kind of maybe on a hill or something like that, which might suggest, oh, this is an older house that someone built like they would on a, a higher elevation. And so uh, when you're doing an architectural survey, you are either seeing older buildings that you indicate on the map with some coding that we would use, or you would actually um, stop and photograph it and maybe go up to the house and, and see if someone's home and try to talk with them about the house. And maybe if you're lucky, uh, get be able to get inside the house and see what's you know inside you can do that sometimes but often not so um, I was doing that um, outside of Pilot Mountain and I was going down this this um, long kind of muddy road where to to take a look at a house that was you know this little black dot on a kind of elevated location and I kind of went and went and went and I got back there to the house and I thought oh it's a house like like 10 gazillion houses around from from the late 19th century kind of a two-story frame three bays wide house just real typical you know there were just many of them around and not very exciting <coughs> excuse me but I thought you know, I've come all this way. I'm going to record this house. I'm going to photograph it. So it was clearly an abandoned house. So I got out and I went and walked around a little bit and went and looked through the screens and the dirty windows in what I presumed to be the parlor. And all of a sudden I saw all of these bright colors on the walls. <clears throat> and I thought, what is this? And they were like in swirls and stuff. And they were in like bright pinks and blues and greens and yellows and grays. And I thought, whoa, it looked like maybe a 1960s psychedelic painting. And I thought, this is very strange. So I later was able to make arrangements to get inside the house because I thought, I think I need to take a closer look at this. So when I did, I discovered that, oh, no, it was not psychedelic painting. It was actually someone um, had painted, painted it to look like marble blocked walls. And I could tell that because all of the blocks were surrounded by like a white line to define the blocks. And then you could tell they were like meant to be marble because it was strange. Just the yellow blocks had like painted veining, like marble vein lines in them. I don't know why just the yellow, but that's what it was. And so that told me that someone was doing marble block walls. And I knew that that was a type of decorative painting, but the colors were just so vibrant. And I thought who would, who would, paint something like this and more to the point who would live in a room like that and then but that wasn't all that was in the room um the, the at the top of the walls there was a vine and hand freehand vine and flower border and then the ceiling was painted a dark brown <clears throat> and then in the center there was a huge ceiling medallion that was painted um kind of a a turquoise blue and had two bands of, of a vine and flower border that were very similar to what was around the top of the walls. And it was like, it was just fantastic. And 
that was kind of, I'll have to say that was the hook that pulled me into wanting to do the study of um, decorative painting. But on a larger scale, I wanted to do it because I, I found decorative painting, to, my, with a background in art history, um, history and architectural history, I found the decorative painting to be surprising, exciting, fun, um, awe, sometimes awe-inspiring, mysterious, and somehow with a lot of the painting, especially with painting like I had found at the Flinsham House, I could feel a sense of humanity in it. I sometimes could feel, have some feelings for the painter. Mm -hmm. um, and so that just really drew me in. Excellent. Yeah, it, it is um it is a wild it is a wild rumpus and it does make you um think about the people doing the work and commissioning the work um a lot. Um to sort of stick with the the idea of studying decorative painting um and and so that that's what that's what pulled you in. What did um I, I guess did you see did you see a need or what did you see lacking in uh in sort of our world of architectural history? Uh, as what was missing with decorative painting? Well, what I thought was, I mean, I was curious, but I knew that, well, <clears throat> I had recorded various examples in work that I had done. I also knew that other people had too, but I realized that there had never been a study that focused on the decorative painting as the topic of the study as a focus of a study. And I thought, you know, this, there's a lot of this out there and it's really pretty wonderful. And I felt like that was something that should be done. And I decided I was the one who should do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. It's always good to study the thing that you want to, that you're That's interested right. in. That's right. Um, so what was your, can you talk a little bit about your approach um, and kind of what, what you mean, what were your steps and what do you mean when you say you studied it? Okay. Well, first of all, my approach was, and <clears throat> not surprisingly, it was an art historical approach. Um, looking at the qualities of the the painting, what it was like, what it was depicting. Um, rather than a technical approach, I, I didn't study it from the standpoint of what type of paint was used. Um, that's just not something I know enough about. That's not what I was doing. So, um, that was my approach. Now, I had to figure out a way that I could could do this because I knew that, you know, how could I reasonably go about studying this? I knew that I couldn't travel the whole state and photograph all of this painting. I mean, there was no way I could do that in my lifetime, much less in any concise period of time. So, um, what I decided was I, I started with the, um, database that way back then, even the State Historic Preservation Office had from their architectural survey program that had been going on since the 1970s. And that really was key to being able to do this. That was just, I will just say it, that was the key to being able to do it. Because of that database, you know, I was able to gather some material. And so what I did first was I looked at um, properties that were on the National Register of Historic Places. And many of them had decorative painting. So I was able to look at those and pull up those properties 
and look at images of all that painting. That gave me a lot of properties right there. Now to that, I added um, examples that I had recorded. I added to that examples that a lot of, I knew a lot of other people had recorded and had let me know about. And then I wrote letters to um, historical groups in almost all of the hundred counties in the state. If I didn't, it was because I couldn't come up with the name of an organization in some counties. But otherwise, I wrote all of these organizations because I figured if anyone was going to know about some good decorative painting, they would probably be aware of it. So I wrote to them, told them what I was doing and asked if they, um, if they knew about things that they would let me know. And so that turned up a number of, of examples and, um, and also made some good context text in um, the process. So that gave me really several hundred examples enough that I felt like I could begin to analyze what I was, was seeing um, and begin to, to make some sense of it. I mean, I knew there was a lot more out there, but I, I just, um, I felt like that was a good starting point. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, it was, it was, it was the best way I knew to, to be able to reasonably approach it. And did, did you know, um, did you, did you think, or did you know from the beginning uh, of this that you were going to do a book or, or when did, when did the idea of putting this into a book <laughs> come together? Well, I always, no, I probably didn't initially think that, but pretty soon I started thinking it because so many people, you know, professional colleagues and stuff, and people that I would see at meetings and stuff like that, and they would know what I was doing. They said, you've got to do a book. Yeah. And everything. And, and I wanted to, but the problem was as an independent scholar, it's almost impossible to come up with grant money to be able right. to, to fund that, to be able to do the additional kind of research and work that I felt needed to be done mm -hmm. to be able to, to do that, much less to be able to publish it. And I couldn't do that on my own. I mean, I had to make a living. Right. Meanwhile, you know, yeah. I had to, <laughs> yeah. During the process of all this, I had to make a living. So, you know, that was that was a real hindrance. I mean, I, I couldn't just do it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't work for an institution or an academic. Um, I wasn't in an academic position where I could have support yeah. that way. So it, it took years. And I, I um, when I was much younger, I thought, okay, I'd really like to have a book out by the time I'm 50. <laughs> Let me just You're say, about 50 now, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> I was gonna say, let me just say that didn't happen. <laughs> you got a book out before I turned 50. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good enough. And, and really, and should I say something about that? I mean, I how this happened that a book came out? Yes, yes. Because yes, it was please. sort of a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I considered it that. I really was about to give up and to come to terms with that. And I thought, you know, I, I applied for a grant and I didn't think that I would probably get it, but I felt like I really needed to do it. Needed to take another, you know, I needed to, to try again to do that because I, I had found a place that did give some grants to ind independent scholars, not many, Mm -hmm. but they did so that you know it was a chance so I did that and I not surprisingly I did not get the grant so I just kind of came to terms with that myself and then what happened was I guess um, I had done a nomination of a church national register nomination of a church that had wonderful decorative painting in it and Ramona Bartos had 
come to be, you know, head honcho okay. in the state preservation office. And so she was at the National Register Advisory Committee meeting and she had seen all of that. And she talked with me after and she said, well, you need to do, we need to do a book or something. And I said, oh, well, that would be nice. You know, she said, well, we need to make this happen. Well, the wonderful thing was that Ramona had just been put in a position where she was also overseeing publications. Mm -hmm. So Ramona made it happen. Very good. Yeah. And I mean, she did. Yeah. And that's what happened. And that's how the book was done. Excellent. Well, we're so, I think, uh, I, I'm delighted it, it's been done. And I think uh, our, our field of knowledge is, has been greatly enriched. And uh, for those of you out there who might be listening and you're not an architectural historian, it's also just a beautiful, beautiful book. It's really, it's really a beautiful book. Let me say one more thing about that. That's, that's kind of funny how things turn out sometimes. Mm -hmm. if, if I had done been able to do the book much earlier, it would not have been the same book, I don't think. One of the things that was really important to me was that it be all in, in color. Yes. I mean, we're dealing with something, we're dealing with art, and yes. we're dealing with stuff where color is very important. Well, back then, it would have cost a fortune to be able to do everything in color. Mm -hmm. But then as time went on, it got to where with technology that it didn't cost a fortune and it was fine to do that. The other thing was that I knew very little about the painters themselves. Uh -huh. But what happened was much later, it was a thing called newspapers.com. Yes. And with that, you could go and you could plug in stuff like, um, fresco painter or decorative painter or wood grainer or you know all kinds of things related to painters and you could put in a period like 1800 to 1900 or something like that in North Carolina and all kinds of things would pop up yeah and so I would get all of these ads advertisements painters advertisements mm -hmm. just all kinds of stuff and it was just wonderful. And, and it was, it, it broadened um, so much the information that we had. And so that couldn't have happened earlier. Right. So in a lot of ways, you know, it was just maybe kind of meant to be. Yeah. That, so, it, so that, it, that it didn't happen earlier, that it happened when it did happen. Right, right. Yeah, so, I, I, I agree. I think we, yes, I agree. So I just wanted to say It came out when it was supposed to. Yes. Um, so what, um, what did you learn in, uh, about decorative painting? What did you learn about the people of North Carolina? And what do you think decorative painting tells us about North Carolinians who came before us? Well, what I think it tells us about people who, who from, that period, and I was looking primarily at 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they were a lot like people, many people today. They wanted to be fashionable. They they wanted to be up to date with stuff, and and um, decorative painting allowed them one way to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it made their homes fashionable. Do you, this is um, maybe a little, well, not really off track. Do you think it um, offers any, do you think there's any commentary there on the way um, some houses, not, not all examples, but some examples are really um, elaborate, uh, either elaborately academic or just elaborately um enthusiastic um are found in, are found in really really homes with really really modest uh exteriors does that um does that does that does that say anything about people's 
thinking or character or what was important to them? I think it says a lot about how this happened. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was very surprising to find that, to find examples um, in all different kinds of, of houses. Mm -hmm. So, for example, many people are familiar with Coolmore mm -hmm. Plantation outside of Tarboro in Edgecombe County, just a fabulous house. Well, the owner of Coolmore was able to hire um, an architect from Baltimore and the architect from Baltimore was able to um, get E.G. Lind, who was um, um, a Russian born painter living in Baltimore to come and do the decorative painting there. And the house architecturally is an Italianate house and it's a wonderful house. The painting likewise is wonderful. It's very sophisticated. It's very um, academically done. I mean, the painter was very well trained and the painting shows it. It's just over the top. I mean, it's just, just amazing. That's not real surprising because you'd say, okay, these people had money. They built a big fancy house they were able to hire an architect and a painter from elsewhere, from a style center, which was Baltimore, mm -hmm. and get them to come and do this. What was really surprising um, was to see, um, go into a house that was um, out in Lincoln County, um, on the border of Lincoln and Catawba counties, that was the original part of the house was log, and then it had a frame addition. And in that frame addition was a couple of a couple of rooms that had painted walls look painted to look like big panels, and it had a stencil ceiling, and it was very sophisticated, too. Yeah very well done it's like what what is this doing here well you figure probably what happened was there was maybe an itinerant painter who was coming through and offered his services um that happened a lot um itinerant painters would offer their services maybe for room and board um, and maybe some additional money. But that's what happened with the, the Flincham parlor, which was not sophisticated, really. Uh -huh. um, the family uh, who I was able to interview, because it stayed in the family for generations, and they, they loved that room, amazingly, and they took care of it. But they said a man came maybe from Mount Airy and, um, you know, offered to, to paint it and everything. And um, I think they said there were different family traditions about what his name was. And it was very frustrating because I looked up, you know, the census and other things, trying to find someone, you know, with that name or trying to connect and, and I just couldn't, but um, so, You know, the painters connected with owners in different ways. Now, with a place like Coolmore or other, you know, more urban places, not places out in the country, mm -hmm. sometimes like the owner of Coolmore, they were more tuned into style centers in the country. And so they, they knew about what were the latest styles and they wanted them in their houses because they were like, like their house, the painting would be like a, a status symbol. Right. The people out in the country, 
didn't necessarily look at it that way. And yet they thought, well, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Why don't I do this? And maybe sometimes the painter would say, well, I painted so-and-so's house, you know, like this. And they got, I understand they got lots of compliments on yeah. it. Do you want your house painted that way? You know, that kind of thing would happen. Mm -hmm. and, and then they, you know, they'd like it. They'd say, well, this is different. You know, uh, I think I'll do this. I mean, you know, we kind of don't know all of that, but um, so there were kind of different things going on. Yeah. So you've got, you've just kind of, you've touched on it a little bit, but um, who, sort of who were, who were the clients um, who, who wanted these rooms and who wanted this painting? And then um, I know you've already said, we don't know a ton about the painters, but, um, but who were, who were the painters? Okay. Well, the clients, like I said, varied mm -hmm. and they were, they, they, they could be more in town clients who um, either were more familiar with things that were in fashion um, and, and wanted to follow that mm -hmm. and could hire known painters. Sometimes they were painters who, well, this is kind of meshing mm -hmm. together, but Painters who um, who lived in the town and advertised and did a number of um, uh, houses in one place. So um, you have that sort of thing, and, and and you have you know a number of kind of more you know wealthy owners mm -hmm. hiring more sophisticated painters right. to paint for them. Yeah. Um, but then you have also a lot of people out in the country who were just yeoman farmers, mm -hmm. middling farmers, um, who, who maybe didn't have that much money mm -hmm. to spare, but, but they could provide room and board Right. And if you're a traveling painter, that's what you need. Right. And, you know, it's nice to have a little more money, but you really need room and board and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and those painters, some of them, as we've seen, were clearly trained. We don't know where. Mm -hmm. could be different places, sometimes with another painter or sometimes up, you know, they could have been trained up north, you know, and they make their way south. Um, some of them weren't, I, I don't think probably were trained, but they <laughs> see some other painting and they say, oh, that's cool. You know, and then they kind of go off on their own and, and develop their own interpretation of mm -hmm. be it marble blocked walls or be it, um, you know, um, types of wood graining like yeah. one, one house that you know I got used to seeing um, tiger grain and bird's eye maple graining used together mm -hmm. and then there was this house that I used to call it had a wainscot that was wonderful that I used to call the leopard wainscot yes because it has all these well we'll see it later yeah but it has all these bright spots on it and everything is like, whoa, until finally, I mean, I looked at the stuff enough and I realized, oh, what they were doing was they were painting this tiger grain maple on the, the styles and rails around the panels and in the panels with all these dots, they were painting the bird's eye maple. Mm -hmm. They were just using kind of bright colors and everything and they were just wonderful, but, but yeah. really off, you know, I mean, really very imaginative, very creative. Um, that's that's one that's one of the ones, fun you know yeah that's one of the ones where i'd say a wild a wild rumpus um a wild rumpus, yes. <laughs> and i just think those things are so much fun yes yes they are um so i um i asked my colleagues at the state historic preservation office if they had any questions for you and i had two pretty specific ones um and and julie uh julie smith is our new national register assistant 
And her question ties in um, a little bit to what we were just talking about, about sort of who, 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 was, who was commissioning this and why. Um, she had heard one time, I believe on like a um, house tour or something, that faux marbling or um, marbleizing was more expensive than real marble, and therefore it was more of a status symbol than real marble. And so question one is, is, is that true or was that ever, ever true? And then it also made me think of the portrait painter that you show an example of in the book where his subjects are in rooms with um, marbled or decoratively painted wainscots and baseboards. So I just, could you speak to the possibility that decorative painting was more expensive or, and how it was a status symbol, at which I know expense and status symbol aren't necessarily 100% aligned. Okay. I, I don't think that it, I don't think that it was more expensive than marble. I think it was more accessible than marble in most cases. Mm -hmm. I think that some people in more urban areas would have ex access to marble and could afford it. Mm -hmm. But even some of those people, when given the choice, would decide to do the, the decorative painting, would decide to do painted marbling because it was the latest fashion mm -hmm. and therefore could be like a status symbol. And furthermore, if the fashion changed, you could paint it over. Right. You could, and in fact, we have examples of that in North Carolina, especially the Edwards Franklin House in Surrey County, where um, you can see on a door where there was one period of wood graining, and then it was later over painted with a later period style of wood graining. And there was a wainscot in that same house that had wood graining from a certain period. And then it was later overpainted with marbling. Huh. Wow. So, you know, we have examples of that. Yeah. And so that sort of thing could be done. And so that could influence a choice. In that case, I don't think they would have had access to marble, you mm -hmm. know. But in urban areas, some of those owners would, but they might choose decorative painting anyway. But I don't think, I don't think that decorative painting was more expensive. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Annie McDonald, who is our preservation specialist in our Asheville office, asked about the connections between decorative architectural painters and furniture painters. So could you tell us what you know about those connections? Well, I think that I, I think that definitely there was a close connection. I mean, all you have to do is look at some of the the graining um, on architectural wood graining mm -hmm. and the wood graining that you might find on furniture and other articles like it could be chairs, it could be um, um, wardrobes, it could be blanket chests, it could be smaller, you know, boxes or things. And it's kind of all of the same kind of graining mm -hmm. to see how that would happen. And also um, you see the, some of these same painters off, also did like carriage painting or sign painting and their advertisements list all these things as as some of the, the kind of work they do because they had to be able to do um, a variety of things generally to make a living. Mm -hmm. They couldn't just do one thing. They, they had to offer a variety of services. Right. So do you have um, 
have you have you made any kind of definitive connection yet? I will say yet because that leads to the next question. But um, do you know anybody that this this painter, Mr. Smith, here's an example of his historic interior, um, his interior painting, and here's an example of his uh, uh, furniture painting or an example of his sign painting. Would you repeat that? <laughs> oh, sorry. I just said, have you, have you made it? Have you made it? Um, have you identified a painter where you have an example of his interior house paint, his decorative interior painting, and his um, furniture painting? No, I haven't. It's hard enough to identify a painter, a specific painter, with interior decorative painting. That's unfortunately rare. We have yes. names of lots of painters and we have lots of examples of interior decorative painting, but connecting the two is hard. Yeah. And we've done that in some cases, yeah. but it's, it's not, it's, it's rare to be able to do that. So I will, um, I, I, we will all remain hopeful that at some point um, we identify more, more painters and connect them to their, to their yes. work. Yes. Um, well, I, my, my theory is the more you uncover, the more examples of a particular type of uh, thing um, that you find, the more likelihood you're going to be to find out who that painter was. Yes. Particularly if it's kind of a complex um um, group, you know, of, of, in, at one place of, of types of paintings, types of painting used together. Right, right. So uh, that leads me to ask, um, uh, do you consider yourself to still be studying this topic and, and do you expect to uncover more? Well, I, I will have to say I'm doing, I'm studying it to a much lesser extent now. And at this point, I depend largely on what I've learned now comes largely from people contacting me and telling me about things that they have found that they're excited about and they want me to know about or they want to ask me about, they have questions about, or want to know if I've seen anything like that. Um, so that's how I find out about a lot of things now. Um, and do I think that um, there's more out there? I think there's a lot more out there. And I think it's going to continue to be found. And um, there are two reasons for that. One is that you know, I was talking about the architectural survey work and how sometimes if you go up, if you're going to photograph a house and you go up to the house and you introduce yourself, sometimes someone's home and sometimes they invite you in and you're able to see, you know, if there's any decorative painting inside. But many more times you don't have access to the interior. So you don't know whether there is or not. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a lot of places where there's decorative painting and we just don't know it. Even places that have been photographed, the exteriors have been photographed and, and recorded, but we don't know about the interiors. The other reason I think um, that a lot more will turn up is that a lot more has, some examples have turned up through um, uh, restoration work either in removing later coats of paint uh -huh. or wallpaper, uh -huh. decorative painting will turn up. And that in fact is what happened with one uh, exciting find um, that turned up as, as the preparations for the book were coming to a close and suddenly, uh, you know, a young couple was working on a house um, outside of Boone and um, the house had been a church and had been turned into a house and they were removing a lot of wallpaper 
and underneath it was um, on the ceiling, especially, was all kinds, was a whole lot of decorative painting. And, and it matched up with decorative painting that had been found in some other houses in North Carolina, mm -hmm. in a house in a church in Georgia, in a house in East Texas. Wow. And I think it was done by the same painter. Wow. And here was this other example. It was like, aha! You know, it, it, it was just wonderful. It was so exciting. So I was able to go out and photograph that and there are pictures of it in the book. Oh, good. But, you know, that <laughs> happened just as, you know, things were coming to a close with the preparation of the book. And so for those two reasons, you know, what we don't see in survey and what gets uncovered during restoration projects, I think they're going to be just a lot of things that keep turning up. And that's, yeah. I find that exciting. Yes. Well, one thing, Laura, in your acknowledgments, you thanked um, the homeowners. And as, as a survey branch um, supervisor, I also want to thank the homeowners for letting you in and, and for letting all, so many of our architectural historians, myself included, into, into their homes to take pictures and, and gather information about their houses. We, we couldn't do any of our work, um, and certainly your focus on interior painting would be impossible without without people um, letting us in, uh, which right. is which is really really kind and generous. Um, and I, I appreciate that. And I know you do. And um, well, and, and one thing about that is, so often I found that people don't, so many people don't realize what they have is special. Right. You know, they're used to, if they've lived in the house, if it's a family home or something, I mean, they've lived with it for a long time. They don't know that it's something that really is special. Yes. yes. And that other people would consider it special. Right. Yeah. You know? And so that also brings me to, to add that if you, if you're watching this and thinking, um, I know a house with, with painting uh, inside it like this. Um, I hope you'll call my office. Um, we can we can get that documented and find out if we already have it documented or not, and um, and possibly put you in touch with Laura. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you if you know of a house that has decorative painting. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, ask a question before we look at a couple of pictures, um, which I know you're not you're not really gonna answer, but it's uh, I know people want to know. Um, what's your, do you have a favorite example or do you have a favorite method or style of painting? Okay. <laughs> Question number one is impossible for me to answer because <laughs> there are just so many, the, the, the richness of the decorative painting in the state is, is so great. And there's so many wonderful examples that I just, I just can't possibly choose one that would be my favorite mm -hmm. I just can't if, if if in terms of the type of of painting I thought about that a lot and and I thought you know I really like all of the types I mean we have freehand painting wood grained marbled um smoked painting um marble blocked or stone blocked painting, stencil painting, trompe l'oeil painting, which is painting that fools the eye, mm -hmm. or scenic painting. Mm -hmm. And I find all of those, all of those can be pretty wonderful. Yeah. Whether yeah. they are um, really sophisticated or whether they are, um, Um, imaginative. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I guess if I had to pick one type, mm -hmm. I would say the trompe l'oeil painting. Uh, yeah. in, in a sense, all decorative painting is trompe l'oeil painting because it's painting that doesn't it, it's doesn't really exist. I mean, even wood graining, you're painting something that to look like something you're you're painting like 
wood to look like a type of wood that is it isn't really right right so you could say all of it is but way, the way we really use it is to look make things look three-dimensional right to really trick you yeah yeah and yeah. and so that's probably my favorite type mm -hmm. well let's um let's look at a couple of pictures um and uh and see what we can see okay all right so um this is the Flincham house that we started out talking about um, to begin with. Right. And um, so, Laura, if you just want to tell us a little bit about what we're looking at. Yes, and it, and it, and it was storing hay. Yes. As you can see, uh, <laughs> uh, which was typical. Some other places stored tobacco. Um, but you can see, I think you can kind of make out the that those, that they're blocks of, of painting in different colors. Mm -hmm. And the colors are very vibrant. And you can see the vine and flower border along the top of the wall. All you can see of the ceiling there is that it's dark. You're seeing part of the dark brown ceiling. You can't mm -hmm. see the, in that picture, the ceiling medallion. But the, the main thing is just that an amazing, wall I mean you've never seen marble that looked like that yeah <laughs> but this painter did in his mind yes he did yes and there was another house in uh, this was outside of Pilot Mountain there was another house that had the same painting that was in Dobson uh-huh and the county seat and it was it was torn down but mm. there was another example of this yeah yeah uh, Matt, if we could look at the next picture. Okay, this is a, a really um, um, strong co comparison of contrast. Um, on the left is uh, part of a ceiling from Coolmore, the, um, the house that I said was so um, elaborate and had a, a painter from Baltimore, but who was uh, from um, Rush, Russia and was, was very well trained. And that the ceiling actually has some real plaster work on it, but what you're seeing is trompe l'oeil plaster work. Um, in the the curved band there in the left and you see they've painted like shadow to make it look three-dimensional and then the the whole medallion in the corner um is painted three-dimensionally and and it has a um added a, you know flowers and stuff each corner of the ceiling had a different arrangement of flowers but it's, it's very precise, uh, very well done. Um, and so that is one extreme of the kind of painting that you could have. Mm -hmm. On the right hand side is that leopard wainscot I was talking about that I eventually realized was a painter, um, a painter's, a less conventional painter's version of tiger grain and bird's eye maple with the tiger grain uh, being painted on the styles and rails and the bird's eye maple where you have all kinds of little dots and everything in real bird's eye maple uh, painted here on the, the panels. But you've got blacks and yellows and reds and you don't see that in nature. <laughs> 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 just so I always call it the leopard wainscot, but I I really it was it was I may be a little slow, but it was a long time of seeing a lot of 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 painted you know um, uh, tiger grain and bird's eye maple decorative mm -hmm. painting before I realized what this painter was trying to do, and of course that made it even more wonderful. Yes, those yes. are those are two extremes. Yes. Um, of the types of painting you can find. Yeah. 
Um, and and I've, I've been lucky enough to see both of those in person also. And the, um, I mean, Coolmore, Coolmore is breathtaking. You, can, you have to get right up to those paintings to know they're not 3D. Um, and then the smaller house in Edgecombe County, um, it, it, is, it is fun. It is, it is wild and, uh, and, it, and it's fun and it's joyous and it's just a real pleasure to, to be in those rooms with that, with that painting. Um, Matt, can we see our final picture? So, Laura, do you want to just sort of give an overview of what we're looking at here? Okay. Um, this overall is just to give you a sense of the richness of the decorative painting that can be found in North Carolina. But to be more specific, if you wish, in the upper left corner is the stair hall from Coolmore, which all has all of those panels are trompe l'oeil panel. They aren't real panels, but they're painted to look like they are. In the top row, the center uh, painting is um, a door from um, the Edwards Franklin house where you see that little square that has an earlier, uh, I know it's kind of small, but it has an earlier uh, period of wood graining. And then a later, closer to mid 19th century uh, over graining on, on the door. And in the upper right corner, you have a um, house in uh, Salisbury that has very sophisticated a ceiling. That's a ceiling, a very sophisticated stenciled ceiling. Um, in the middle left uh, painting is a, a, a marbled uh, baseboard that is very well done. It actually looks like real marble. Uh, the center right is that ceiling uh, that Sarah was talking about that she saw as a child that was smoked, a smoked ceiling with, you know, I was looking at it and all of a sudden it was like, what? Those are initials. And I thought, oh, they must be the initials of the painter. And I thought, how clever. <laughs> But I never found the painter's name. You know, you think with those clues, you could be able to come up with a name, but it, that never happened. It was so frustrating. Um, in the center um, is the Rucker Eves house in Rutherfordton. And um, it also is stenciled. And it, I loved this house because it looks from a distance to be very well done. You see close up details of it. You see that it's not really so well done. And, and there are places like where if you are looking for example at um, where the circle meets up with those outer bands that spokes that go out Mm -hmm. and you have the um, um, diamonds and half circles and the little drip drip spots. Things are going really well. Um, as the painter is working down, you know, one row, but then he comes to the corners and suddenly he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> He kind of is like, uh. <laughs> and it's stuff like that, that for me just kind of brought out the humanity. Oh, yes. So yeah. it's, like, it's like you just think of these painters as real people, you know. Right. And the center medallion that you can't see, the very center of it that you can't see so well because there's a, a lighting fixture there, but it's not quite as well done as you might think. But I saw this, um, first saw this at um, 
the Preservation North Carolina Conference. Mm. And they were showing as part of this house, they were, was a house that they were trying to sell, you know, revolve. And I, I suddenly looked at it and it's like, wait, that's like a couple of other houses, you know, uh, in that, at that point, that was really early on. It was like the ceiling um, of this house in East Texas that I had recorded and like this church in South Georgia and stuff and, and one place in North Carolina that I knew about and it was like, whoa, here's another example. And so after I found out about it and then I went and photographed it, but that kind of started on uh, this collecting of examples of this particular, um, I think all done by the same painter. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of cool. In the lower left um, um, is the painting from the Blair house. And you see that on the, the cover of the book, but you see a lot more of it because that parlor has a lot uh, going on. Just in this photograph, you see stenciling at the top. You see the arch is really a trompe l'oeil arch. And then you're looking through it and you see the scene. So it's got scenic painting over, it's over the mantle. And then in the center, the bottom center, this was a, a house that had been turned into a tobacco barn, but the wainscot had these um, funny things that looked like a paisley kind of thing, or they look like whales kind of. And I realized, again, it was sort of a bird's eye maple thing, but you realize that they are stamping, they're taking a, a hand that's maybe bigger than mine, but you'd have this large part of it and then the fingers that curl around yeah. and you'd they'd stamp huh. the paint and that's what's creating those like whale like, yeah makes sense and which was kind of fun I thought <laughs> yeah and, and then in the lower right is a marbled wainscot from the Edwards Franklin house so all of these uh, are just kind of um a collage of the wide variety and, and the richness, I think, of, of decorative painting in, uh, in North Carolina. Well, thank you, Laura. This is, this is definitely, it's been a wild, it's been a wild rumpus. And, um, <laughs> and I really, I'm so thankful you collected all these images and put this together in a book. Um, and it is, it's just a wonderful book. And um, I hope everyone will go, go buy it and, uh, and enjoy it. Thank you very much. So I'll just um, end with a quick reminder that Flyleaf is a monthly conversation and um, you can find information about upcoming conversations on, um, on our Facebook page. Uh, there are also some past recordings uh, and, and this will become a past recording on the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources YouTube channel. So um, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. It's been such a pleasure. This has been a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you Sarah.